Hello, 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 hello. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 790. That is 790 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. And I'm so happy to meet you and to see you and to feel you and to be in your ears, in front of your eyes, on your hands, all over your body, all over your chest and your back and behind your knees. I hope you are happy with that too. And if you aren't, <laughs> tough luck, tough bloody luck. But seriously, welcome back to the Axino Zynga Show. It's so amazing to have you here with me today. We're coming at you live and direct from an undisclosed location somewhere in the depths of London. And I hope wherever you are, you're feeling fine, you're feeling dandy. If you're wondering how I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm not going to lie. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm not going to lie. Just came back from a good little gym session to start off the week or to end the week or to start the week or to end the day or to end the week, whatever it is. I had a good one. Nice little pump in, feeling absolutely sprightly, feeling absolutely ready to roll. Um, I do prefer sometimes on the Monday going to the gym, maybe early in the morning or trying to go as late as night as possible just to before I get the kind of like, you know, late rush in, especially just after people finish work. It's kind of a nice time to go in. I usually like to stack up my plates. I'm one of those annoying people that I prepare my rack before I'm about to work out. So I have my racks or so I prepare my weights by my rack when I'm about to work out. So I usually do like, you know, um, back squats and overhead presses and deadlifts and stuff. So I want to have all my plates that sorted. I usually have a 20, a 10, a 15 and a five. And those are all very popular plates, especially the five and the 10. Everyone always wants that flipping plate. So I like to have it just there prepared. But sometimes you feel a bit guilty taking all those plates um because people keep asking you in between sets if you if you're using this using that and you don't want to be the annoying person that's like yeah i'm using everything you know what i mean you look like a bit of a hoarder so i let people just use it whatever but to get away from all that because i hate communication i detest communication in the gym there's nothing i hate more than communication because i think communication in the gym is almost like an enforced hmm, it's almost like going towards the direction of group activities and there's one thing if you know about me I hate group activities. I hate group fun. I hate anything that involves a collective. I detest all of that shit, especially like stuff that's meant to encourage you. Oh, hey, we're a team. Go away. Go away. You know, go away. So in order for me to like not talk to people and be on my own and be focused on my workout, because I don't even touch my phone. That's how flipping discipline I am when I go into that gym. It's a crappy gym. It's a whatever gym in the area. It's not something to really write home about. But when I'm in there, I don't even touch my phone. I usually put my phone on shuffle or I play an album from the beginning to the end or I have two albums I'm listening to, one to warm up, one to get into the workout, but I'm not even hanging around. So if I'm not hanging around diddling and dallying on my phone, the last thing I want is for some guy to be like, oh yeah, using this, can I jump in? It's like, bro, shut up, stand by the side, let me finish my thing, and then you can go on your thing as well. I legitimately think some people have a mental illness. I think you have a mental illness if you decide to go to a gym and give somebody unsolicited advice. You have a mental illness. There's something wrong with you. You probably need to go see a doctor, a psychiatrist, something. You're not all there in the head if you have to go in there and give people unsolicited advice. No one wants your advice. Nobody cares. More and more I start going to the gym more regularly. I'm starting to realize now where you see those pictures, right? Or those clips from that gym in America that's like purple. It's a bit of a hood one. It's a bit ratchet. That Wherever that gym is, where all the equipment is purple. And you see people doing crazy things, right? Jumping up and down, swinging, doing everything wrong. Now I get why that happens. Because most people like me, most people don't want communication. Most people just want to go in and do their thing. So if there's some guy by the flipping cable rows doing some crazy workout, you're not going to tell him that he's doing it wrong. He'll figure it out. And I think that's the best way to go about doing it. Because in my opinion, the times that I've gotten injured is because I've done something wrong because my form was wrong because i wasn't focusing well so i messed something up maybe i put so much weight on the thing but usually injuries are the best way for you to learn in my experience especially from being in a gym for a while especially from training for a bit and all that malarkey when i've sp when i've kind of sprained my ankle running when i've pulled something in my back squatting or something that's all because i didn't run correctly or my form was terrible when i was back squatting so that person doing that crazy flipping barbell workout and he's clearly rounding his back and not being flat and you see he's gonna you know clip his ankle or twist his arm any minute now leave them alone let them do what they're doing either they get injured or they learn 
or they don't get injured and they just keep doing what they're doing anyway but nobody needs anybody's advice especially nowadays we all have phones we all have social media if they haven't figured it out by now maybe they'll never figure it out and i really don't think it's some strangest place to tell them maybe different if you work in a gym and you're like a pt or something and maybe it's just hurting your eyes seeing somebody do something wrong cool but if you're just an average civilian just going up to people and it's not and it's not even like it'd be one thing i could kind of understand it if you were one of those like creeper good dudes who like to you know hit on girls in the gym if you're like hitting on girls but then you're you you were kind of doing in a sly way by saying oh let me give you some advice on your deadlift you got behind them and then give them a bit of a dagger in fair play it's a bit creepy it's a bit disgusting but at least you're going for something you know that's somewhat pleasurable you know going to the man them and telling them oh yeah here's how you should do an overhead press here's how you do, should do a dumbbell curl here's how you should do a fucking jumping jack it's like bro nobody needs your advice man most people in there are just trying to get their arms swell for a t-shirt for summer most people are just trying to get their you know the six pack that it's not no one's here training for the olympics you know what i mean like no one's here training for the crossfit games like keep your advice to yourself nobody needs it nobody wants to hear it let alone me let alone me the, the the flipping number one survivor of like being on my own in there i don't want to hear it from anybody please shut the hell up it so annoys me i swear to god i get so rage filled when i see some guys just go and you can tell as well i think i think it's similar to girls you know how girls can always tell when someone's about to say something to them i think it's the same thing in gym with dudes I think you could just you got a feeling you could just tell which type of guy is about to come over and be like um do you mind if i jump in um actually you're meant to be doing it's like actually nothing actually shut your fucking mouth how about that actually shut your mouth how about that before i flip in drop a plate on your head or something like honestly it, it angers me so much it really does maybe there's something wrong with me maybe i have some Maybe I have the mental illness, right? In my inability to communicate with people in real life, my inability to let people kind of come close and all that malarkey. Cool. But I don't think I'm the exception. I think the most, the majority of people out there would rather just do their thing wrong in peace than have somebody give them unsolicited advice. I would think so. I would hope so. But again, what do I know? What do I know? Cool. So this is actually thing show i'm coming at you live um for those of you watching the, sh the show live via the youtube i haven't got my chat up on my screen so i'll be checking intimately here and there if you guys say anything in the chat um all of the tts's have been turned off so if anything comes through i'll shout that out at the end of the show as per usual when i do this type of thing but yeah man sit back and enjoy the i go see you know zinger show first topic that i want to talk about is regarding tommy richmond big up my guy tommy blood clout richmond so he just announced on his instagram that he has a new album about to drop he says announcing my debut album is called coyote back of billboard magazine thank you billboard shot by josh belvedere so i'm kind of happy with this i'm not gonna lie I, I know there's some fans out there that aren't too stoked on this but i'm actually quite happy about this so if you don't know tommy richardson tommy richmond sorry richardson richmond went viral um maybe a few months back when he dropped that song called million dollar baby which is an absolute bop it sort of reminds you of like the neptunes timberland early 2000s kind of production it maybe even it maybe actually even sounds a little bit like hot in here maybe um or devil's aligned us but you know that kind of bounce right so with the whole y2k trend being very much in vogue right now this sound kind of blew up his voice is very unique very sultry r&b trap soul type of sounds and just in general just something fresh and for people to listen to especially considering you know the r&b landscape is a little bit i would say stale but it's not where it probably should have been now especially when it comes to these sort of kids so i'm happy to see him around especially considering you know post malone has gone completely pop and country root he's kind of filled that void in terms of that you know sonic sounding whatever thing that he puts out and um you know million dollar baby did what it did i think it went to about number two in the billboard chart so it went super super crazy um i think i must have saw it maybe on instagram the first time it just kind of blew up almost kind of overnight then he followed it up with another song called devil is a lie which personally for me devil is a lie is not the greatest um i feel like the best part about devil is a lie is the part that doesn't include him singing it's the start of the record 
there's a little like 30 second bit just before as it starts the production is just so such a bop you could probably loop that that first that first 30 seconds and have a little bit of a bounce so unfortunately um there was a lie isn't the greatest but what i liked about devil's a lie it kind of followed the same sort of vibe of million dollar baby so what i would assume is that he's probably got loads of tunes in the fucking vault that he's about to drop on the album so this is just like you know just to kind of get you excited or to get you curious for the album coming up because it didn't sound too great but i'm also aware that he probably doesn't want to blow his load too fast and drop another banger on the level of you know million dollar baby and now people not care about the album you kind of want to build a bit of anticipation and i also like and i also 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 like that he's dropping the album fairly soon he's kind of capitalizing on the momentum because allegedly according to tommy richmond fans online again i'm not that well versed on the kid i've only just got on i've only just got hip on him because of million dollar baby but according to actual tommy richmond fans he's been grinding for a while he's been you know an actual underground sensation not a, not a industry plant he's kind of come up the hard way and you know as luck would have it you know you don't you kind of make your own luck that song blew for a million dollar baby and he's kind of been able to capitalize it so i like the fact that he's obviously got a discography he's obviously got a catalog that he can release he's obviously confident in his sound and we just happened to see one that blew up but he's been doing what he's been doing for a while i like that kind of blow up as well because it means when the album drops it's not going to be rushed it's going to be like a build up of his life's work it's going to be on that first album so i also like the fact that you know like i said the, the first turn of the fast turnaround like hey here's my hit record it's blowing up on the flipping socials it's going up in the charts i'm not going to wait until next year i'm going to actually drop the album now which makes sense um there's still an ability to maybe drop the album now maybe go in a bit of a tour at the end of the year maybe do some of the festival circuits but just in general just to capitalize on momentum because you'd imagine you know in music with like with a lot of things in the world it's never a sure thing and it's a hard grind who knows how long this kid's been grinding who knows how long he's been putting out songs and getting like one view two listens on fucking soundcloud now he's finally got a hit record or he's finally blown up let's forget hit record i think when you're at that sort of level you don't really care about hit record you all you care about is that blowing up so now he's finally blown up music is something you can do that professionally full time now why would you wait you know why would you wait because you never know this momentum could disappear you should just capitalize on it and just try and see wild one because if he flops on this first album it was always going to flop anyway but if he's successful he can ride that wave you know for a number of years and kind of keep going on so i really do back this approach i hope the album's good when it does eventually come out um sonically and sound wise hope he just keeps honing in on that the the neptunes timberland-esque sound um, especially if he's got the right producers under his belt i think that'd be flipping incredible to do obviously in the future have him having an actual record produced by the neptunes will be sick but unfortunately nowadays as much as i love pharrell he's just not the same without the influence of chad hugo um it's just not the same you know it's just not the same um anymore his productions aren't that great as they probably were and um, maybe again because he's got so much on his plate louis vuitton his own brand bloody blah 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 so maybe that's kind of you know kind of adding to the fact but the productions so far haven't been the greatest from pharrell but that'll pretty that'll be a good look for him anyway if he did end up getting a pharrell co-sign but happy with the album drop i love the urgency i love the fact that they're trying to capitalize on everyone knowing who he is now and not waiting until you know the hype settles and then trying to recreate something they're putting it out they're confident in the material and let's hope let's hope for his sake let's hope for his sake that when it does drop it's flipping hard Next on the music front, I wanted to also mention Don Tolliver's new album, Hearthstone Psycho. Wee! Album is flames. Album is flames. I don't think a lot of people are talking about it. I don't think a lot of people are talking about it, and I don't know why, but the album is fucking flames. Um, Don Tolliver, again, I don't know what you call, I keep calling it like trap soul, trap R&B, but whatever that flipping genre is, just look, let's just call it R&B. Don Tolliver is really at the top of his game. I like the fact that he hasn't tried to severely change his sound he's just been perfecting it and honing it over each consecutive album i feel like he's dialing it in more and more and more and more and more hence the confidence with the features like i don't think i would have expected personally for me him to have a kodak black feature but that kodak black feature might be the best song on the album and there's a lot of good songs on the fucking album so that's been really cool 
it's also been really cool i'm not gonna lie to hear him and cash cobain because a part of me feels like there was a part because i was listening to a lot of that cash cobain song you know he's got a few songs that i've obviously dropped on most most everyone kind of knows him for the fisher track but i was listening to a lot of his tapes and shit and sometimes you, you you'd be led to believe that other oh, cash cobain might be a bit harder than don Tolliver. but then when you hear don Tolliver and cash cobain on the same track you're like okay cool don Tolliver is definitely clear of him but i like that they they sound different i think i think if you don't hear them on the same track you think they sound similar but when you hear them separately they sound way more different and obviously the inclusion of flipping charlie wilson in that song attitude like absolutely fantastic um and again um loads of really great um travis scott features on there too my favorite travis scott features actually track 13 this particular one inside it sounds like the r&b of old the type of stuff that you'd play after a breakup you know in your car windows up loud as fuck you crying and just blazing through the ends and stuff and just singing the lyrics at the top of your lungs you know what i mean that's the type of song that it sounds like it's it's incredible i really fucking love that um a real deep cut on there the ted's a touchdown feature is also cool and um, backstreet's track 11 and um, there's a couple of future tracks on here i think there's two if i'm not mistaken isn't there two or is there one I thought I heard Future in another track. Or maybe it's the bonus. I'm not too sure. But the Future record anyway is really good as well. Purple Rain. Um, he sounds incredible on it. But I just think as an album, as an entire album, it slaps from beginning to the front. And it's got 18 tracks or 16, 17, 16, sorry. Um, for me, usually, I'm not the biggest fan of, you know, albums, uh, you know, outside of the 12 track mark. But I think he absolutely crushed it on this one. And... A lot of people aren't talking about it. I think more people need to speak about this album. Another contender for me for album of the year. And I'm really hoping, um, fingers are crossed, every toes are crossed that this kid improves his live performances because God damn it, man. I saw videos of him performing live and I wasn't impressed, really wasn't impressed, man. It kind of was a bit of a letdown. I think it might have been a rolling loud performance and mostly because of the backing tracks. Like I don't know why a lot of these new kids like to perform with their backing track which essentially is them just rapping over the mp3 you already have on your phone they might lower the mids or the highs a bit but they're just screaming over a track you already have on your phone when they in general should be screaming over an instrumental like i want to hear you breathing i want to hear you fucking up the lyrics and whatever that's just what you do at live performances or maybe improvising and having a different section or looping a section whatever it may be just mixing up a little bit and giving the fans or the viewers a different sort of look to what you actually do because you can never replicate what you do, you know, like for like on the record live, or well, most artists can't, but I feel like the live performances really let him down, really, really let him down. Now, again, that could be an exception. It could be a one-off, um, you know, rolling loud, you know, you know, rolling loud is rolling loud, but I really want him to go all the way, like actually go all the way, maybe have a band on stage that like actually invest that money into doing a show. Cause I feel like if he does that, that would just take him to the next level. If those clips go viral of him performing, you know, and flipping um, and singing Attitude, Bandit, you know, Ice Age, Inside, Kryptonite, like singing all these hits on this flipping tr album, just singing them, like actually with his actual voice live on stage, it would be incredible. Because look at Gunner. Gunner's currently on tour with his album. He did a homecoming show in Atlanta and Gunner's smashing it, I think, because, you know, He's, he's just really good at music, obviously. But also, when he performs live, he's doing it sounds a backing track, which is quite refreshing because people from that kind of camp, the little babies, all those dudes, they don't really perform like that. So he's going that step above and performing with that backing track. You're hearing him actually sing and rap live. He's got the whole set design going on there. He's got different sort of outfits and shit. He's lost a ton of weight. So all that is a package and it helps to promote the music. Because then you see, you're like, oh shit. He looks like, you know, he looks like he's like legitimately 100 pounds lighter. He's singing his fucking ass off, rapping his fucking ass off on stage and absolutely crushing it. And that really goes to kind of take his music to the next level. So I'm hoping, hoping, hoping Don Tolliver does the same thing because you can't make an album of this level and just go on stage and just do the same old same old and kind of phone it in with a DJ at the back you know with his Serato and shit like please up the production quality I beg of you because Hearthstone Psycho deserves it really recommend you check it out again really 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 good album and I really hope 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 and pray more people check it out I really do hope and pray more people check it out but again what do i know absolutely nothing i don't know a damn thing a damn thing
moving on with this i also want to mention this <laughs> very funny article or very funny story post courtesy of my guy over and under so as some of you guys know i've covered a lot of the tremaine emery ups and downs the founder of denim tears who was formerly at supreme as creative director he had a bit of a breakthrough i feel like an awakening when i was listening or watching an interview that he did with um I think the business of hype with Angelo back, the founder of Awake. And it seemed like he was awake. It seemed like he had finally, you know, realized the error of his ways. And he came to the conclusion that maybe both parties, him and Supreme, were to blame for how it ended over there for him. And then shortly after, he dropped that systemic racism capsule thing, a bit corny, a bit lame, but I get it. But now it seems like he's going full steam ahead with hating on Supreme again and reminding us that he got fired. You just can't let it go, it seems like. So this is a post courtesy of Urban Under that details a post that um, Tremaine did on his Twitter in relation to the Supreme 30th anniversary party, which they had recently in Webster Hall. Big up Webster Hall. I remember going there a few years ago, back in the days, actually. Absolutely amazing, legendary um, New York venue. If you know, you know. Supreme did their special anniversary um, party there. They had Little Yatty and Cash Cobain performing. And this is not the picture that Tremaine added on his Twitter. They added this after the fact. But the actual post is the post. So Tremaine said on his Twitter, white men in the office, black people on stage performing. It's called black entertainment. And then, of course, over and under whoever put that picture after the fact. So it's him basically subtweeting Supreme's party and essentially saying, oh, essentially reminding us of what he reminded us in the interview when he said that he was shocked and appalled when he went to supreme and he found out that everybody in the head office was majority white but then in the stores in their editorials in their lookbooks they always presented this kind of you know united colors of benetton skateboard brand that was worldwide and multicultural and blah 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 diversity was like in their name and it was a real big bug it was a real kind of beanie's bonnet over that sort of thing and personally it's just sad to see i'm not gonna lie as much as i would like to dunk on a guy and like laugh at him i think it's just sad to see it because clearly this guy is still tore up about how this ended and you can kind of understand why um allegedly according to him actually he was getting paid like what half a million dollars to be a creative director of supreme if you think about it given his experience given his name given his notoriety his clout levels it should have been an easy job it should have been an easy job to collect your check to get a bit of extra clout bone to get a bit of extra clout points um and to maybe learn some things that you could then carry into your own brand really and truly and i think as a design challenge um it's an interesting one to approach like you have a very specific voice and a lane and the sort of thing that you do with denim tears and then you're asked to kind of take some of that and sprinkle it in on supreme that should be an interesting challenge to try and see what you can get away with underneath that kind of supreme banner especially with them being bought by vf corp so you've got all of these you know things that you kind of need to kind of maneuver around and really i feel like if you're a real designer designer if you're a real creative right that's part of the appeal that was part of the the flipping thing that'll get you excited for a job like that because you're doing your own thing underground you get this big paycheck from this big company and then it kind of feeds all the shit you're doing so essentially what it would what it should do is take the pressure off denim tears so you can maybe do some more fun interesting things um it'll be very hard because i think as a you know a lot of designers out there have proved them the most recently being a good example it's very difficult to kind of split your creativity or your design powers across two brands especially two with very different voices two different customers it's very very difficult to do at a high level so something will have to give eventually but for a short period of time run it up collect that bag feed that money into your brand take the pressure off then in tears a bit and then who knows even the cash itself could give you extra runway for another 12 18 months you know how fickle fashion is things can change at a dime so it will be a good thing so maybe deep down he is really pissed off at himself for literally fumbling the bag or maybe it really did hurt him the realization of going somewhere and figuring out oh shit this place of my dreams this place that i absolutely always wanted to work at because you know me growing up being a supreme fanboy there was a time where i always wanted to work at the store there was a time where i always wanted to be a you know working in the head office and be being a part of the team or whatever same with the whole nike thing right but then sometimes you go to these companies and you actually work for them and you realize oh shit this isn't the place that i dreamed about this is actually a fucking nightmare which is why sometimes and i've kind of learned this the hard way 
it's really important to just be a fan and be okay being a fan because sometimes when you know too much when you get to, when, when you start seeing how the sausage is made as Brendan Shaw would say it will really kind of sour um, the love that you have for the brand and sometimes it will ultimately make you very cynical and you don't want that especially if you want to be creative you have to be a little bit optimistic you have to be a bit of a dreamer you have to have your head in the clouds a little bit so being that cynical grumpy you know sod isn't really the best for creativity but all in all all in all, all in all, it's just sad to see. I'm not going to lie because there was a moment where I thought Tremaine had finally let go. He'd finally moved on. But it seemed like he just cannot let go of how it ended at Supreme. Which makes me think that there must have been some things that happened there behind the scenes that he hasn't really spoken about that really cut deep. Maybe one of the things I was thinking about that might have been something that kind of annoyed him was the fact that he was hired as a creative director. But then when he got there, he really wasn't a creative director because James Jebby is still in charge. And then on top of that, I think he mentioned one lady called Erin McGee, who was like the first, I remember her from back in the day because she was like one of the first like women that had a streetwear brand, like a prominent one. It was called like Made Me and she was always associated with Supreme Store. And I didn't know that she still worked there. She's been there for like 26 years or something. This lady, she's like got really short cropped hair and shit, blonde. And she had this brand called Made Me that kind of did like, I don't know, like athleisure, athleisure kind of bike wear, short things, whatever. I forgot what it was. It, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the biggest brand, but I remember her being a little bit of a staple back in the day in New York and shit. And allegedly she was pissed off when Tremaine got the job, which you can imagine why, right? Imagine working at a company for 20 plus years and you're doing design and whatnot. And then this black guy comes in who's got a brand where he puts fucking, you know, cotton reefs all over the hoodies and shit. You must be sitting there thinking, hold on, you hide an external person. It, it's going to be annoying if you hire an external person but imagine you hire an external person and they're denim tears or they're tremaine emery that's going to piss you off if it's like a high level designer who's like you know super creative super forward thinking pushing the envelope maybe you might be like okay cool i contest but maybe in erin mcgee says she's like i'm better than this guy so you hire him he comes in and then as soon as he comes in he turns that shit into fucking you know he's out here protesting and shit He's straight on the fucking race card thing. He's calling you out, calling this out. You're like, fucking hell. So they obviously butt heads. And maybe them butting heads or some other stuff is just really... It, he hasn't been able to let that shit go. It's kind of eating away at him, which you can understand why. Because again, you know, think about the micromanaging side of things. You know, as much as I love James Jebbia, he doesn't seem like the type of person who's going to relinquish control. He's very... I'd imagine he's probably a little bit of a, you know, um, micromanager. I assume he's very hands-on doesn't know how to kind of delegate probably which again is a good thing because that's why supreme's around 30 plus years you don't you don't survive 30 years in streetwear with you know being bought out by a company or you know having investment from a large company and shit you know by being hands off by going and signing yourself or whatever you you survive 30 years because the founder of the company is still very much involved so you get sold on the dream you get this job you think you're the next Virgil. That might also be the thing as well. You think you've got the baton. You think you're going to be that guy. You finally get that role. You go there. They sell you They sell you a bit of a dream. You you end up... Because that's happened to us before. I'm sure some of us have happened. You know, you've had a, you went to a job interview. You thought it was one thing. Then when you start, it's completely another thing. So that's also can kind of hurt. But I think in this case, if what he says is true about Denim Tears, if they're doing millions of dollars per year every time they drop a, dead, a cotton reef shirt, he's got um, a cotton reef collection, sorry. They've just opened a new retail store, all these collaborations. If this is all true, why are you bothered? That's where I'm thinking, hmm, is it all a ruse? Is Denim Tears actually not doing as good as he says it is? Because if you're actually doing well, if, you're, if your brand is actually popping, if people really give a shit about what you do, if you're really doing numbers, if your Shopify is going off, why would you give a fuck about Supreme's 30th anniversary party? Especially, why would you give a fuck because they've got Yatty and fucking Cash, uh, Cash Cobain? Like, these these are kids that are current. They're, you know, I think I think Yatty might be the oldest. I think he's at like 26 or something. Of course they're going to have them there. Yeah, he was modeling for them. Cash Cobain is, like, from New York. Like, he's got the whole, he's got the fucking city in the ball, in the palm of his hands right now. You could probably, you know, I'd bet the, the story in New York, they probably blast Yatty and fucking Cash Cobain songs on the fucking sound system all bloody day you can understand why they would play it the kids probably like that sort of stuff so i don't really think because they you know got cash cobain and little yeti to perform at the 30th anniversary party that it means that they are some sort of i don't know what what he thinks they are but i find it absolutely insane legitimately insane and i'm also not really sold on this idea that you know it's a bad thing that just because the head office is majorly white i don't actually buy that either 
I'm, I don't I, I don't think so. Especially a brand like Supreme. They've done so much for people that aren't white especially when you think about the people that have left that company or who, who have represented them in some way, shape or form and have gone to do big and great things. I think they're allowed to have a bit of a whitewashed head office. I think they're allowed. You know, they have a store where they hire literally every other race under the sun except for white for the most part, especially the store here in London. You know what I mean? It's like it's like going through the ends sometimes, going in there. You can barely hear yourself because the music is so loud in there. But yeah, like I think they're allowed to have a whitewash office. I'm not going to lie. I think they're allowed to have it. And I don't think it kind of, you know, looks bad on them for doing so, in my personal opinion. But I would just love the guy to just move on. Really would like him to move on. Really would like him to just be like, okay, cool. It didn't go well. You know, what can I do? It is what it is. Just move on. Because this is getting a bit embarrassing. And I'm glad I'm not the only one that thinks that. Because if you look through the Stay Grounded TV account, Big Up Stay Grounded, um, they do great stuff as well on social media if you want all that streetwear news. People in the comments are saying the same things. Some guy says, yeah, I feel where he's coming from, but he's married to a white woman. The white woman thing, I don't even think is important. I don't think that's an important thing. That's a little bit, you know, I don't think that really matters too much. It's just the fact that you just can't let go. That's the issue for me. It's like he needs to move on. You could be married to whoever. You could, you're too allowed to complain. Just because you're married to a white person doesn't mean you can't ever complain about white shit. That's kind of weird. Um, another person said, yeah, um, Emery is the corniest person in fashion for a good minute now. See, like, this whole stuff is ruining his reputation as well. He's making, I'm sure he doesn't care, but online wise, he's starting to look incredibly, incredibly corny. Unfortunately so. And he's not, you know, I've met him only what, a couple of times. He's a fairly cool dude. Seems quite intelligent. Seems to have his head screwed on correctly. So I'm not really too sure why Guan. I'm not sure what happened to him or why he's like this now, but all of this crying and complaining isn't the Tremaine that I once knew. It continues. Black women on Instagram, white women in the bedroom. <laughs> He's called white entertainment. Another says, once again, he's not the one to be spreading this message. Stop giving this corny guy a platform. Then in tears won't matter anymore next year. I'm actually curious to see what does then in tears do actually next? That cotton reef thing is going off. Everybody wears it. I feel like whenever I've been to the airport, I'm not going to lie. I feel like I've seen so many people wear the cotton reef. And again, it could, whether it's real or fake, it doesn't matter. The fact that they're wearing your brand is the main thing because it means like it's fucking popular. I think I've seen such an increase in people going to the airport wearing that denim tears cotton reef sweatsuit. Because I feel like in the past, I saw a lot more like Yeezy, Pantone type things going there when you went to the when you went to the airport. Now I'm seeing a lot of people dressing up in that cotton reef hoodie thing. And I'm like, wow, bro, this is becoming like the airport thing to wear now because it's a bit luxe, it's a bit streetwearish, it's a bit comfy, you know, kind of got all of those mixed into one. But it's also a little bit of a one trick pony thing. Like, what do you do next with that, or can it last? Like, you know, like other monograms. And just be something that they do again and again and again. Will it kind of like get become corny the same way the Avisu sign became corny at one point? I wonder. I'm really curious because, you know, he seems, you know, he must know, especially on their end, that no one really cares about their quote unquote ready to wear outside of the cut outside of the cotton reef stuff, you'd imagine. Um, no one really cares about that sort of stuff. All they care mo mostly about is that cotton reef design. So I wonder what is next. Do you try to usurp that do you try to create a new pattern do you just keep making more ready to wear and hope that that pops off and people care about your main line curious another says bro is corny i don't get what i did not what did i miss still wear preem before dt and i barely fuck with supreme i see he's salty about getting fired another person here says cry me some denim tears you're the amy schumer of fashion does cotton reef print got your head, bro? Let other people shine without trying to make it about you. They're calling him the Amy Schumer of fashion. I don't agree with this. I think this is a bit too harsh. But this is what happens when you complain and cry all the time on social media. People start saying the most wildest shit about you and it sometimes it'll stick. The Amy Schumer of fashion. Yikes. Another one says, bro, hate white people, but he couldn't leave our women alone to the point of marrying one. LMAO, no one believes this narrative anymore. Another person says, homie was trying to put black trauma on a $44 t-shirt for a majority white, politically ignorant consumer base. He can high road performers um, the moment he gets his own house in order. Oh, okay. Okay. So clearly, I'm not the only one that thinks Tremaine needs to move on and let it go. But will he? 
I don't think so. I think a Supreme has now become a part of his identity. The fact that he got fired is a is the you know part of his story now. He won't ever let it go because I guess the trauma is just too much to process. The trauma is just too much to process. Talking about trauma and talking about processing things. God damn it, I feel bad for baby mothers. God damn it, I feel bad for baby mothers and baby daddies. It must be a very hard thing to co-parent when you're young. It must be really difficult. I've never really thought of it until now. Like, actually co-parent. Like, imagine, you're not together with the baby mother anymore. You're both young. You're both, quote-unquote, in your prime. You know, you both want to get lit. You both want to live your lives. But you've got this baby you have to look after for like the next what 18 plus years you have to be there for this person that you brought into the world who didn't get asked to get brought into the world by the way both of you were irresponsible one person refused to pull out the other person was enjoying themselves too much so you're responsible for this little human this little precious angel you have to look after them they they should be your number one priority your evolve i'm 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 a big believer and this is something that i'm very stop you know fucking steadfast in I detest, I hate, I hate, hate, hate those clips of those women who do like CrossFit when they're pregnant or like the dudes who like run a marathon with a baby in the buggy. Bro, hang it up. You're a parent now. Either go run by yourself before your kids wake up or whatever, but don't incorporate your kids into your life. So like hanging up, you're a parent now. Hang it up. You've had your fun. You've had your thing. Hang it up. Like your mum, you're not a baddie anymore. Please hang it up. Be a mum. Then if, you, if the kid goes up and you want to go back to, you know, living your city girl life, cool. But when the kid's a baby, like, please hang it up. Don't take your kid to the club or the whatever. Hang it the fuck up. But the reality of it is very different. Case in point, this particular post that went viral on my side of social media. It features this one lady who decided to air out her baby daddy because he was at a festival in Malta called DLT. She posted the following. Not financially providing for your one-year-old son and saying you have no money to give, but you're out every weekend and flying out to Malta is crazy. Court is waiting for you when you get back. Hashtag DLT Malta. So she posts this on her social, obviously calling out her baby daddy, who is this guy here on the right-hand side, this mixed race dude. He's having a great time, as you can see in the video. He's going crazy, having a blast. Unfortunately for him as well, it's not even like it's his video. That's the other thing too he must be pissed about. He probably went out to Malta, probably, you know, maybe didn't post on his social, tried to go down a sly, tried to go down some incognito ninja thing. And his boy is the one that probably baited up his spot by posting this on his Instagram stories. And, you know, women are very resourceful. Women are very observant. She was probably following a few of the friends, maybe on some alts and found him in the background going crazy, you know, putting the gun fingers and having a good time, migraine skanking, maybe checking out some baddies, you know, because, you know, guys... The only guys who like to dance on platforms are the ones who want people to be want want to be seen. It's almost like you're like offering yourself up to the ladies down below. You know, it's almost like you're parading yourself. Like, hey, check out what check out my fucking physique. Check out my face. Please look at me. Touch my leg. Please get my attention. And then let's go and finger bang each other in the toilets. You know, that's what you're basically doing. She sees him on there, and imagine how furious you'd be as a mum. All right, imagine how furious you'd be as a single mum at home. You're struggling to keep the lights on, struggling to buy nappies and food, struggling to like just figure out the whole motherhood thing on your own. And this guy who's saying he has no money is out in Malta. It's bad enough when you lend friends money and they say they have no money and you're seeing them buying fucking drugs and they're going out to restaurants and they're buying new t-shirts and trainers. Your blood is boiling. Imagine that being your baby daddy, the, the, the father of your child. Urgh, you're so mad. So she posts that, kind of embarrasses him. You know, he's kind of getting sh publicly shamed online for being a deadbeat dad. But you also kind of think to yourself, wow, man, as Joe Biden would say, deadbeat dads like, have the most fun in it. No one has more fun than deadbeat dads. They seem to just be oblivious to the fact that they have a kid somewhere who needs their love, needs their support, needs their affection. You know, they, need, they, they have a partner somewhere or like, a you know, um, a baby mother who needs some financial support. But they seem to be loving life. They sleep like babies. They have no care in the world. So she airs him out. She embarrasses him. She got a lick back. Unfortunately for this lady, she realized very quickly, as I've always said, my famous saying, which I should trademark, the enemy of women isn't men, it's other women. Like, there's nothing more that annoys women more than men fun. Men laughing, men having joy, men just having a blast. Women hate that. 
if you're having a blast without them if you're having a good time if you're enjoying yourself with your if you're just enjoying yourself without even company you're just giggling or stuff on social media you see their face scowl because you're not doing it with them they fucking hate it they hate it so much right maybe the same way men hate the sound of women talking in the big groups right it's like a gaggle of geese maybe women hate the same thing with guys that are having their own thunder it's like how dare you have fun without me either way he's having a blast enjoying himself getting his tan on maybe you know banging a few slaws all over the motor whatever it may be and i guess the suggestion the hint or the kind of what was kind of intimated from this post was that he was over there motor enjoying herself while she was back at home you know breastfeeding the kid and struggling to kind of keep the lights on well allegedly people found out that she was actually motor herself so she's out here trying to cancel her baby daddy and she's actually in motor herself so who's looking after the kid nobody knows i'm sure it's being looked after but allegedly both parents are in malta <laughs> maybe trying to ignore each other going to separate places it's just fascinating so that's what somebody realized so you know it doesn't it doesn't diminish what she said and how she feels you know the standard fucking disclaimers but god almighty mate come on you try to make it seem like you're the deadbeat but you kind of sound like a deadbeat mum yourself why are you in fucking malta like why aren't you looking after the kid <laughs> anyway number two she says we was not there at the same time so i wasn't the one recording we were in a relationship and he was happy with keeping the baby he came with me to the baby scans and even had blood tests done for the baby he decided to tell me when i was six months pregnant that he no longer wanted him which is even past the legal state of to terminate i'm not saying he's not allowed to go out and enjoy himself but don't be claiming you're broke and next minute going to party on holiday i just want to focus on point number three this is something that i've always been fascinated about when it comes to deadbeats because i don't have the i don't have the confidence i don't have the guts to be a piece of shit i have piece of shit tendencies i can do piece of shit things but i don't think i have the real courage to be a real full-blooded professional piece of shit the type of person who like sleeps like a baby knowing their kids are hungry the type of person that spends money knowing that their fucking baby mother is sleeping in a hostel that type of shit i could never do that sort of stuff right or the type of guy that has like four families on the go and every time you leave your family thinks you're going to work but you're going to actually go look after the other family and you're just balancing them all at once and no no one knows about each other until the day you die and they all fucking see each other at the funeral and then it turns into a fucking wrestlemania that's a true story by the way another time i admire in some perverse disgusting downright weird way i admire guys that can do it because wow wow there must be nothing in that heart of yours because imagine this if this if this what she's saying is true imagine this being you imagine you being okay oh my god hey i'm pregnant you're like oh my god i'm so happy you hug each other you're, you're picking up baby outfits you're picking out names and shit you're there for the entire relationship you, it's looking like you want to you know now the baby's here you want to actually think about long-term future with your partner and then <laughs> six months into the pregnancy you decide nah nah i'm good <laughs> nah you just want to go out and do your you just don't care not even go out sorry you don't want anything to do with her i would love to have that that ability to be just callous heartless cutthroat guy like that just nah i'm good that baby that's coming around that's, that's about to be born nah i don't want to be a dad i'm good keep me off the fucking birth certificate act like i don't exist i'm good <laughs> imagine ghosting your baby mother <laughs> it's bad enough ghosting regular people imagine just ghosting your mother your baby mother to be imagine she's six months pregnant just like nah not gonna reply back not gonna open the texts <laughs> might even block the number imagine what that must take as a man to do that <sighs> That's a level of piece of shitness that I just aspire to have. But I'm just too much of a pussy, to be fair. I'm just too much of a pussy, too much of a scaredy cat to do that type of thing. And the thought of a kid growing up not knowing who his dad is and or knowing that his dad's a deadbeat and shit or knowing that the partner that you, you know, thinks very badly of you and he's sending you mad, bad juju or bad vibes. Because every time you lose your wallet, you have to kind of think to yourself, hold on, did is she is she preying on my downfall? Every time you lose your car keys, you have to think, is she preying on my downfall? 
<laughs> you know, I wouldn't want somebody out there literally praying on my downfall and sending me loads of fucking bad judge. I would never want that. So just for that sake, you know, I'd be present and I'd be buying them Air Force Ones and little Argos chains and shit. Like, I just don't want any, I don't want any issues. But that is wild, isn't it? Like, imagine the kids are suffering without nappies and shit and, you know, you're just there enjoying your life. But again, this lady isn't, you know, innocent in this too, like, you're here kind of trying to bait up your guy and you're also out in motor sunning yourself and shit. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess it's just a young people thing, isn't it? It's just hard to kind of balance all that stuff. Like what what do you actually do if you have a kid and you're still young and you're still, you still want to go out and shit? Do you put your life on pause for your kid? I say you do, personally. I say once you bring a life into the world, your shit has to change. Um, but some people just aren't like that. You know, some people just like, nah, they have to, the kid has to kind of, you know, move to my schedule. <laughs> some people are like the kid has to adapt to me and what i do you know what i mean it's like fuck you know hang it up girl hang it up girl please hang it up but they don't they don't and it's okay i understand why moving on from that one moving on from that one we have to update ourselves we have to update ourselves and talk about the text messages and the <laughs> flagrant behavior the downright disgusting behavior from my goat and my hero and my idol, yay, formerly known as Kanye West. He's been in a spot of bother with this young lady, this very buxom um, OnlyFans model that was an assistant, which is kind of swaggy, I'm not going to lie, right? To hire an OnlyFans model, an OnlyFans sex worker, a prostitute as your personal assistant is kind of swaggy, especially when they look exactly like your wife just this white australian looking lady with massive tits and a massive ass it's kind of wild to do that um obviously you're doing it for your own sexual pleasures and horniness levels and whatever maybe but the issue with this stuff and was something that i guessed from the beginning i guessed this from the start when this story happened i was like you know what i bet you this is more of an issue of kanye not paying this lady as opposed to it being a sexual harassment thing because they did try and make it seem like it was a sexual harassment thing like it was like yay diddy yay harvey weinstein but now that we've got more details of the um, lawsuit himself she's actually filed it under um you know wages not paid or whatever that state whatever that kind of category is she has actually filed the lawsuit as sexual harassment so it's kind of wild because what it proves is that she was okay with what was happening she was okay with Ye sending her all these crazy text messages and shit and being very, very horny in the DMs. But as soon as he stopped paying her, it became an issue. You know, which kind of does makes her a little bit of an unreliable witness. But the texts themselves from Ye, man, like, God forbid, like, that's one of the hells. And that's one of the, probably the reasons why I just like, you know, I just keep to myself. I stay away from things, you know. I'm a married man with a wife and a boyfriend or a wife and a husband let's let's just say that's why i kind of stay away from things because dms and text messages getting leaked they sound good to you on your side but when they get put on like black and white or when they get put in black and white in front of people they sound so wild in it they sound so even the most innocent of thing like wyd and shit you just sound so fucking thirsty you sound so parched they just beggars belief and these particular text messages from from yay they're awful so this is courtesy of my guy over and under it says text from yay in a new sexual harassment lawsuit from his a former assistant and again it's not sexual harassment it's undue wages or whatever it may be but let's continue anyway so these are the text messages that came from yay in the lawsuit themselves fucking wild right <laughs> he's out here texting his girl defendant kanye west aka yay sent the following unsolicited text and videos see my problem is i don't know why they separated it past each line but regardless see my problem is i'll be wanting to fuck but then after i fuck i want a girl to tell me how hard she's been fucked and while i'm fucking them i then want her to cheat on me and go get fucked with a bigger dick than mine and come back and tell me the story then i wanted to suck my dick with her best friend or option b imagine saying option b in it anyway option b suck my dick with a bad bitch and i'm fucking already that i fucked then maybe i'll tell her how hard she been fucked while i'm fucking her then went and fucked somebody with a bigger dick behind my back and told me while i was fucking her so as you can tell kanye has a very 
strong relationship with the word fuck. He seems to love it. That's his favorite fucking word, right? He loves a good fuck. He loves fucking. He loves the word fuck. He loves fucked. He loves F-U-C-K. And he also seems to like, seems to have to be cucked. It's almost like cucky, isn't it? Wanting to know that they've been with somebody and you're there waiting for them to come back to. It's like, que, 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 que cosa? Que cosa? Que? I don't know. Next fucking slide. Kanye West, aka, sent the following offensive text messages. I have a serious question. Be honest with me. Is my Rick Days racist? It is. This fucking racist dick of mine, I'm going to beat this fucking racist dick for being fucking racist. I'm going to stare at pictures of white women with black asses and beat the shit out of this racist dick. This racist needs to be beaten till it can't be racist no more. This ain't right, bro. After 400 years, <laughs> he's still doing the 400 year shit. This ain't right, bro. After 400 years, we still at this point, the richest black man ever, beating the shit out of his big black cock yo yay is a freaky mofo yay is ready at all times and if you thought that was enough all right you know please i'm about to vomit keep that vomit in your mouth one more slide one time i took a viagra and i fucked this a-list celebrity for three hours so they've been retracted who i wonder who it is <laughs> I don't think I've worked out for three hours. I legitimately don't think I've ever played football for three hours, worked out for three hours, played a video game for three hours. I can't imagine fucking for three hours. Can you imagine? For three hours. He must have been on more than Viagra. He had to be on a bit of Molly as well. Maybe a bit of Yay, you know, into the name. Maybe a bit of Ketamini. There had to be something else powering him. It couldn't just be straight Vs for three hours. God damn it. Not sure why that thought, that thought came to me. LOL, like, not sure why that thought came to me, you know. <laughs> anyway i'm gonna fuck the living dog shit out of this bitch off the honey oh honey is a honey pack right i hear people in, in, in america talk about it a lot what is a honey pack i'm assuming that's like viagra or something what is a honey pack honey pack what the fuck is that i hear people talk about that all the time a honey oh a honey pack slang for royal honey vip packets the latest trending it's, it's a gas station fucking vibe oh my god likely gaining no try to just this hit song honey pack okay i hear people talk about this all the fucking time ah i i legit think this i legit thought this is something you put in your tea or something so this is the fucking thing that's make your dick hard i honestly thought this is something you put in your tea like actual honey but looking at the packet, it's gold and has this honeycomb design on it. So it kind of looks like a, you know, some sort of tea thing, but it actually isn't. It's meant to be something that's meant to make you sexually aroused. God damn it, bro. Extra strength. <laughs> okay, it's in it's in the box. I should have known. It does say extra strength there on the box. Extra strength. The ultimate power source. God damn. Okay. Yeah, he's out here fucking on the with the honey pack, all right? So he said, I'm a fuck the living dog shit out of this bitch on the honey. All her friends gonna need to find out where every bitch that fuck with me in love. All her friends meaning something, lol. Kanye West sent the plaintiff another text. You got someone's name's number. I need them. I need him to start fucking some of my bitches. So Kanye is out here recommending girls for other guys to fuck. So he can find, so he can like get off on the knowledge of it or something. Yeesh, this is prime cucky, isn't it? My go is a cuck. My king. My idol. Is a is a cuck. Oof. I love when bitches get the shit fucked out of them and tell me about it while I fuck them. Santa Barbara. But keep that room at the shitty ass Malibu spot. Fuck the shit out of someone else. Yo, fucking hell. It, does he ever say hi? How are you or something? <laughs> Have you eaten? Do you want to like, does he ever say that? Or is he just like, <laughs> is he just straight up <laughs> with this language? Yeah, he's a mad guy. What's this? I need a hug. This is what I mean. Yo, yay. Yay's social media feed is wild. It's a picture of this man. Like this very big black man, you know, straddling and hugging up a very Caucasian looking woman. 
and the text here says yay in between sending videos of defendant client having sex with a model defendant then sent a text with a meme photo below clarifying that he intended and meant when he said he wanted to hug from plaintiff <sighs> again i don't like how this was framed personally because it seemed like from what i've been able to read between the lines this lady was more than comfortable with yay's language and how yay approached things and how she the reason why she was hired why he was paying her the moment he stopped you know cashing or paying the invoices she suddenly had a problem with it and decided to air him out and make it seem like a sexual harassment thing when clearly it feels like to me reading between the lines she was involved in the harem she was a willing participant in some sort of group sex activity i think so i don't think yay's just firing off these texts to people in the hopes that they bite i think she already bit she already had some i mean it's like it's one of the type of things i think so personally again who knows what happens we have to probably wait until the court you know um resumes or kind of um starts with this sort of shit and see what else happens but so far it's not looking good it's not looking good for my goat it's not looking good for my goat it really isn't looking good for him this type of evidence is absolutely wild and what they're talking about, what they're saying, it's not good, it's not good. But I would much rather, again, I think when it comes to still side, I think this sort of stuff kind of cheapens actual instances of harassment and actual assault and actual, you know, rape and shit. Because what is this? It's just some dude that you used to fuck sending you some unsisted messages. Is that really enough for a lawsuit? Should you be really airing this out? Especially if you're actually suing him because he hasn't paid you like get your money i i agree she needs to pay, get her money still doesn't matter what happened between them if you agree to pay her a certain amount she should get it but framing it in the sexual harassment angle it's a little bit lame in my personal opinion a little bit lame but again what do i know maybe it turns out that all of this stuff is real and it's true we'll have to wait and see we will have to wait and see so um this past weekend in Berghain, and it, or in Berlin specifically, there was an interesting kind of like clash, an interesting thing happening out there in club land, um, especially the clubs that I'm kind of interested in or care about. And um, particularly, there were two competing nights happening. There was a regular Ber Berlin, a Berghain club night happening. And there was obviously a really cool night over there in RSO, formerly Griesmüller, where you had someone called Freddie K, legendary DJ, um, playing. And it was the first kind of, you know, weekend where a lot of Berghain regulars loyalties were split and they were kind of you know thinking oh should I actually go to a place that isn't Berghain for one weekend should I actually change my priorities and decide to go to RSO and have a bit of a different time and I personally think judging from the outside looking in it's actually a refreshing change to see that there are there's a bit of competition in that city because I feel like as much as I love Berghain similar to my issues with fold i feel like there's there needs to be adequate competition to keep everybody on their toes the fact that burger is just so much better than the other clubs i feel like sometimes they can get a bit complacent they can kind of put their feet up and shit and kind of go through the motions but if rso is as good as people are saying it is and it isn't a viable alternative i think in general it'll be a good thing overall for people like myself who go and visit you know every other month or whatever and mostly for the people that actually live there they're going to have actual real competition and real good stuff to kind of check out so the two raves that were happening there this past weekend obviously you got the regular club night on the 15th that featured people like boris philip apasho quelza rika zalan vincent newman and obviously in panama bar you had people like alinica playing iron curtis monty luke soundstream all these legends and virginia and then in rso you had this particular party happening um where you had ignes playing um inox tracks rod had vril um adriana lopez freddie k who was a big one yamanas yanamaste 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 phil berg um dj fucky uh, back to back with creda dr jeep back to back with jensen head intercopter who's one of my favorites but obviously the one that everybody wanted to go check out was freddie k um i'm not really too sure what the deal is with freddie k I'm not too sure if he's been removed from Berghain's listings because he used to do a lot of like closing sets back in the day where he was kind of famous for doing these monster closing sets from like Sunday all the way until Monday. Then I think because of COVID, 
Bergheim's closing times changed, so maybe he had to change. I don't know what exactly happened, but I'm sure somebody would know um, what the actual deal is. But Freddie K seems to be doing a lot more raves and a lot more sets at RSO now and other venues as opposed to playing at Bergheim for the most part. So if you're a Freddie K fanboy or a Freddie K fan, you're now following him and going to other locations. So it's kind of split loyalty. So because Bergheim lineup wasn't the most star studded, but still had a lot of good people there, like someone like Quasar, Philip Pasha, and Vincent Newman, always going to bring people out, people were actually split as in where to go and I think it's a good thing but I'm also been curious to see a lot of people say that RSO isn't really that great and it's a sad thing to hear because RSO if you're not aware is the re reincarnated version of Grease Mueller which is a legendary Berlin venue which unfortunately had to close so they relaunched it under the title of RSO it's in a completely different location it's a little bit I want to say it's a little bit far but it's a little bit out of the way kind of most of the clubs are I don't know how to describe the area, but most of them are kind of like central and northern kind of area, whereas RSO is a little bit more southeasterly kind of area down sort of kind of thing, a little bit closer to the airport. So people don't really go out to that sort of area. So that's probably why a lot of people are probably not fans of it. But I am liking the fact that they have a different approach, it seems like, to the booking, and they seem to have a different approach when it comes to the entries. Um, it seems like they're trying to focus more on a younger crowd, they're trying to mix up the bookings and have it be a little bit more different to what Bergheim do. So you have like a need to go there because it feels like a bit of a destination and maybe they have to get convince people to kind of go there in general. But I like that kind of approach. But unfortunately, because it's mostly focused towards a younger crowd, you also get a bit of dodgy people. A little bit of dodgy people. You, you get sometimes dodgy nights. So from what I've been able to hear and kind of read between the lines, it's a real flick of the coin as to whether or not you're going to have a good time or not. Because sometimes, you know, for the most part, as most of you will know, you know, the crowds really do dictate how good of a night you're going to have, unfortunately, in a lot of club spaces. They do dictate. And even if you have good, great DJs and a great club, if the crowd is off, you're never going to really have the greatest of times. And because they may be prioritizing having more of a younger crowd and letting those kids in more, the crowd is a little bit more amped up, maybe a little bit more druggy, maybe a little bit more loud maybe a little bit more like you know um misbehaving if that is a, if that is even possible in a nightclub and that's maybe putting people off but i think my personal opinion is that i like it even if it's wrong because what thing i don't like and that's something i've kind of done myself is the constant comparisons people are having with rso and Bergheim. i think two clubs can coexist and i feel like they should coexist by doing two completely different things and i think comparing one of the greatest clubs in the world to a club that's just started is also unfair and i think we should just stop that comparison flat out no more comparisons just let one place exist as it is and let the other place exist as it is and let people decide what they want to do but i was curious to see actually via the google reviews what people actually think of it because i actually haven't been to rso yet i've been to Berlin or berlin a number of times over the last few years and shit but i haven't actually been to rso because I've just been lazy to go on a traverse over there and I've kind of been stuck going to Bergheim, going to fucking, um, what's it fucking called? Um, Else, going to Trezor, going to Same Heads, Paloma Bar, like all these places I've kind of been more focused on going there than going to other places. So it's kind of making it hard. But let's actually see some of the reviews here of what people have actually said about their times that they spent over their RSO. So this first person says, um, this is uh, from a month ago and they gave it five stars we had an amazing night there the club is a beautiful location inside an abandoned brewery inside its two stages separated by long corridors and outside place i think the outside can be improved for example with a bonfire spot another oh the bonfire spot i think they're mentioning is because that's what they used to have at chris miller he said this really big bonfire spot thing i think they had one even in the middle of these chairs that were kind of like in a circular shape that was pretty cool to kind of you know trip out and smoke some weed and enjoy yourself out there when you're clubbing another one says another positive thing is often i noticed the awareness team around checking that everything was going smooth in our case we queued for 40 minutes and didn't have any problems at the entrance good to hear another person says here one of the best clubs in berlin not too strict door selection possibly um to buy tickets in advance via your ra good crowd and great sound system toilets get, get crowded but great club on the topic of the tickets in advance i've kind of changed my mind on it I remember ages ago saying one of the things that's kind of sad when you go to Bergheim, especially when you get in, you feel really bad for people that don't get in, especially the ones that queue up for hours. Because I feel like in the past, I remember, and I don't know if this is me being too drunk or too high and misremembering, but I swear I remember back in the day before the pandemic, 
when you queue that burger kind, if the queue was like an hour long or something, the bouncers would come down the queue at least until the barriers and tell people in the queue, hey, you're not going to get in. You know what I mean? And just let you know. If you want to stay, stay, but we're not going to let you in. So at least then you could just leave as opposed to queue up for two hours, get to the door and then be told not tonight. So I feel like buying the tickets in advance for a club that's got a door picking selection is a bit of a trap because you're going to buy a ticket, you, you're, you're ready to go, you queue up, you get to the door and they say no because I don't know, they don't like your vibe or something. You're going to feel super pissed off because you fucking bought a ticket and you in your head you think ticket guarantees entry but obviously in Berlin everything's upside down. It's a bit different that way. They kind of, you know, they don't really care if you have money. They kind of care about your vibe and, you know, maintain the sanctity of the club. It's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit snobby, a little bit pretentious and shit, but it works, unfortunately. Especially once you go in, you realise, oh shit, all of that fucking care and attention into picking who goes in actually does equal a better environment. And sometimes just having people jump through hoops, make sure that they're on the best behaviour when they get inside. So I feel like the whole ticket buying thing in advance... I feel like they should stop doing that and just let people just queue up and then if you can get in, you can get in, then you pay. But giving someone an option to pay for a ticket and then they, and then they queue 40 minutes, even if it's 10 minutes, if I bought a ticket, I have to get inside. If you deny me, I'm going to throw a fit. You know what I mean? Um, it continues. Good crowd, sound system and toilets get very crowded, but very good club. Nice mix of tourists and regulars, which I think is a good, which I think is a good omen for them in general. Um, let's look at a one star review. One star review. This person says as follows. I really loved this club before, but after today's incident, I will never come back here again. The bouncer simply does not respect the public and makes people wait in the cold, deliberately letting people through very slowly, creating an appearance of a large queue. In a two hour queue, he let just maybe two people through from a line of people who had not bought tickets in advance. But all the club is empty because it was only the start of the party. All the guests turned around after standing in the cold for hours and left, never returned. I never seen this before. Even when the club is overcrowded, people are at least let in and then the faster speed then it's in a club so by what i can deduce from this this person was just pissed off by by being made to stand outside i'm not gonna lie i think that city is unique i don't think i've noticed that in any other city in the world where it's almost like they they make you stay outside a little bit longer and i think it's maybe a little bit of a mind trick thing to kind of make you like super excited and nervous and all your best behavior and sober you're up wherever it may be but they do do that quite often and with a club like rso because it's newish because they've you know they're kind of getting their footing maybe some nights are kind of empty maybe they're doing good cue control who knows but this is definitely on purpose by the way it's 100 percent on purpose but i also think it's also people's expectations like if you're used to just going to like a regular cocktail bar and just walking in if someone makes you wait two minutes, it's going to feel like an hour. You know what I mean? Because you're just used to just walking into a club or walking into a bar. So going somewhere where they make you wait in a snake of a barrier queue, where they make you fucking answer questions as to why you're there and you almost have to fucking apply to get into a thing, it can be a little bit disconcerting. But I think this is probably uh, something that happens in most clubs in Berlin, unfortunately. Another person says here, yeah, RSO, aka survival mode. Highly recommend to wear two socks and high boots and a jacket that covers everything, even your eyes, if you're queuing in the winter. Not for the week. We lost some men that day, queued for four hours, left my own dignity in the end. Yeah, I've done that before myself too. I think embarrassingly so, embarrassingly so, one particular Berghain night, I queued up in the queue for like six hours, I'm going to say, about six hours. Embarrassingly so. And I think that might have been like, just after the pandemic ended, I went to like one of those, you know, Club Sylvester things. And I'm thinking it might have been six. Maybe it was maybe it was five. Maybe it was exactly five hours. That was very embarrassing. But that was also not my fault because I got there just when the club was full and the queue wasn't that long. I was literally by the end of the barriers. So I could technically see the door. And that's the worst place to be. When you can see where you're about to go, it's worse because you don't want to leave because you're like, I'm just there. But you're not really just there. You're like, you know, there's still many people in front of you. And of course, people have to queue jump in the queue as well. So <sighs> I'm embarrassed by that. I really am ashamed. I don't talk about that too much, but I did eventually get in. But I remember getting in thinking to myself, like, what am I doing, bro? Like, I remember there was a time back in the day when the whole food truck thing was big. We, me and my friend, were, we used to queue for burgers and we thought we were losers then. We'd go to all these different parts of London to go find the best burgers. There'd be people cooking them in fucking food trucks and shit. And you have to queue sometimes for an hour. For your, for your fucking smash burger and shit. And we thought we were losers then. But at least it's a fucking burger. 
right? Like a good cheeseburger, a good smash burger with good fucking meat, with high quality cheese, American cheese, whatever, melting in there with some great bread toasted. You know, that, that shit is probably worth queuing for an hour. But a nightclub, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Six hours. I'm so embarrassed. Another person says here, one of the best clubs in Berlin, front door people are always super nice and inside it's super safe for women. I appreciate a lot. The music is always good. Another one says here, our friend tried to put us on the list, but we still were turned away at the door. There's a first for everything, I guess, but a little extra to be invited to a party by an artist and then not to be invited by the key venue. <laughs> no cue. And our friend said that they to end someone else's set early because there were so few people there. Next level bad man as apparently this weekend was super quiet anyway. So I love this. I love these reviews because it's almost like they're trying to diss the club by saying, oh, your club is shit and it's quiet. But you still wanting to go to the shit quiet club. But I love the fact that Berlin clubs can get away with this. No other place in the world. That's why I think we should stop comparing Berlin. And especially I used to do myself. I'm kind of speaking to myself here. Stop comparing Berlin to any other city or any other place in the world. No other place in the world can get away with treating their quote unquote customers this way. Where like, you know, like this per if this person said, what if this person, what they said was true. A friend of theirs was playing at that club, was a DJ. They put them on the guest list which is a free list, which is, should be a kind of VIP, how you jump the queue thing. And they still won't let in. And then their friend also had to end their set early because the club was empty. Imagine how that must make you feel. Your friend who's an artist puts you on a list, you can't get in because the club says, nah, you're not cool enough. Nah. It's like only Berlin could get away with having a guest list that still required you to like, you know, put on your best like happy face when you get to the front of the queue. It's tough, but I do like the whole like, you know, oh your club is empty anyway it's almost like you know when guys get rejected by girls and they're like oh you're ugly anyway who would want you uh, do you know what I mean look you're super fat it's like bro you came up to me because I said no and I am, now I'm ugly similar to this sort of thing so I kind of like this I'm not gonna lie I like how random and how up and down everyone's experiences I think somewhere in the middle is where it kind of falls it kind of reminds me of like you know when you see like one star restaurant one star reviews for Chinese restaurants and shit usually oh my god the service was horrible it means usually the, the restaurant's fucking banging um last uh, let me just want read a couple latest ones and i'm going to move on to an actual reddit review that broke it down really well and um, this person says just a day ago this place is the most racist xenophobic place i've ever seen the guy at the door is on his high horse gives you ridiculous questions in order to deny entry into the place for no reason <laughs> no, that is a reason though right if they ask you questions like it's a little bit obnoxious and it's a little bit self-absorbed. It's a little bit annoying when they ask you questions anyway about who's playing. It's almost like, you know, when you apply for a job and they ask you to send examples of your work or to do like a, a quiz or to do like some brief or something. It's like, bro, I'm not working for free. I applied here because I need money. I don't fucking, I'm not trying to audition for your fucking startup. Like, go fuck yourself, right? So it's probably the same sort of feeling when you go to a club and someone says, oh, who are you here to see? It's like a DJ, obviously. Like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> well, what are you here to do? Take drugs and drink and, you know, and try and fucking swap spit with somebody. Like, what else am I going to be doing here? So it can be quite annoying, but I think, unfortunately, for these people, unfortunately, you don't know until you get in that all that stuff is actually beneficial because once you get in, the vibes are usually immaculate. Like, in all my times being in Berlin, I've never once seen people fight on a dance floor and this is me going to all the shitty clubs too you know the fucking sissy fosses and shit all these places i've never once seen a fight on the dance floor ever in my life and you know i can't m the amount of times i see people scrap in 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 london even in weatherspoon you know it's over fucking three digits so all of that pretentious shit that they do all those jumping of the hoops it does actually benefit the dance floor unfortunately so this person says the guy the door is on his high horse ridiculous question to deny entry when um where we had even purchased tickets ahead of time online and he cancelled them when we got to the front of the line i have had i've i have traveled all over the world have never been treated like this unless you are a local berliner they will treat you terribly tourists stay away categorically stay away so i want to check some actual pictures of the spot because i actually seen what it actually looks like in a long time but you know allegedly it's a nice little spot to kind of check out um the building looks pretty cool i'm not gonna lie former it looks like it looks like a church isn't it almost 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 has like churchy vibes about it but i quite i quite like it i quite like it and it's got a really nice outdoor area too i think where they do like street food and street markets and shit 
Um, they have people performing on the outdoors as well, but it's a it's a quite a cool little spot. It's a it's a great it's a great sort of like substitute for Grace Muller, which was kind of a similar sort of vibe, very industrial. But that's the original Grace Muller. That's the Grace Muller that I remember. This long dance floor with the DJ booth at the end, with these um with these panels with the colors and the light will be coming through early in the morning, and you'd be tripping your fucking balls off listening to someone playing some minimal shit in the background. Like oh, good fucking times. I miss that venue. Anyway, let's actually read the Reddit review because I think the Reddit review is actually quite good. This person put through. So this is a RSO as a Bergan alternative. Somebody posted it the other day. So it said the following. I want to share my impressions of an RSO visit and have them challenged with other people's thoughts. It was my first visit for a Club Nuts equivalent, which is the Bergheim thing. I've been several times before, but only for parties like Gegen. I was in there only from Sunday from 4 p.m. until 3 a.m. the next morning. First of all, I think the competition for Bergheim is great. Everyone runs faster when you feel someone's breath is on your neck. I get the feeling, though, that RSO doesn't intend to be a one-for-one copy, but rather find its own audience. I've never been to Greece Media, so I don't know the history fully, but since this party provided a killer lineup, even for Bergheim said, the comparison should be fair here yep agree with that one the venue i really like the setup of the place i think it worked out great yesterday lots of options to chill inside and outside without stairs are nice getting to the robust um, building after being out in the sun always completely blinds me though and constantly running to people and the swing sorry i'm just puzzled why some summer wasn't open on sunday i know i know plus points for accepting credit cards at the bar so i agree with that one i love the food container was open but the hot dog was sadder than anything um person going to a nightclub and complaining about the hot dogs is like me when i used to complain about the air conditioning it's like what it continues robot sound system was great freddy started um super early piercing loudo it was hot on the dance floor but not Bergheim in the summer hot and seemed like to have a good ventilation in general what's up with the fucked up dance floor though there's a height differential potholes and in general stuff that fucks up your body while dancing on it the 18 year olds might survive but my old bows definitely don't yeah this is something that only people in other countries get the pleasure of air conditioning air conditioning doesn't exist here in retail stores let alone nightclubs so when you do go clubbing make sure you bring a vest or take off your top because most places are fucking sweat boxes um it continues queue management was atrocious as always um it's not busy at all when i arrived but still took 30 minutes to get in as a ticket holder toilet lines are chaotic but rather quick that's a plus so this seems to be like a constant thing with greece i'm oh, sorry with rso the queue management and i wonder what it, why it is it must be because of these fucking barriers maybe because they're purposely doing that thing that clubs do where they make you stand outside so that it can make the club look like it's more busy than what it is and people are walking by they might want to go in that might be the reason but i'm curious to know why they are not l just letting people in because you know the the annoying thing about this club as you can see from these pictures of people there the door is right by the side of the street so it's not like you have to like there's not much distance because bergan's a bit different right the door's right here the door's right there where you have to go in so they make you queue this long snake queue like you're in a fun fair or something but the door is right there so it's, that must be highly 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 annoying um and then you've got another picture here of the side of the door as well so this must be one of the things that frustrates people like you're going there you're trying to fucking have a good time and the door is right there but they're making you snake around it kind of i think that's if it happens in disneyland they will make you like they make you sit wait in this fucking snake queue the door is right there and then it doesn't really go that far so maybe it's a mental gymnastic thing maybe they actually are busy maybe they're trying to abide by the fucking fire code thing and they don't want to let too many people in and get fucking fined who knows but that seems to be a constant complaint for people online here that they're just not letting people in fast enough which is you know annoying to say the least i could only imagine i could only imagine so going back to the review itself on here um this is in my view the two big fails of rso its operations are lackluster if i'm not amateur level and whoever designed the entrance should be sent off to a remote island from selection to the bag check to the wardrobe it's just an insufficient mess the biggest joke is that the bag check didn't even check anything they slapped my full bag and asked what's in it clothes and i was sent in and compared to my first ever rso visit where i was searched 10 minutes ahead of time head to toe and it was the only time where something was found on me i'm all for relaxed bag searches but didn't you learn from the perceptual pepper spray fiasco there's some middle ground here 
that's fair. Um, to be fair, I think bag searches in general, doesn't matter how efficient they are, they're always a bugbear. I've been in fucking Bergheim before and I've been waiting 10 minutes to fucking get seen by people. And if you've been in Bergheim, you know that the bag check area is huge. It's like a huge section. There's tons of people servicing you and it still took fucking ages. Sometimes when the club's busy, the club's busy. And I think in other countries, maybe it's different where you guys are, but in London specifically, people don't really like to leave their bags in cloakrooms. Um, I think in Berlin it's different. P people actually put their cloaks, their clothes in the cloakroom. In London, mostly people don't go with a jacket anyway, right? It's like up north, you just go without a jacket, just so you don't have to fucking put you put yourself in a cloakroom or waste money or bring cash. But I think in that particular city, people love to like wear clubbing outfits. So they take like big coats and then they put their coat in the cloakroom and then go show off the clubbing outfit on the dance floor. So that's why the, the cloakrooms are just always rammed. Sometimes you have to go early just to get your fucking shit in a cloakroom. Imagine that. Imagine how lame that is. Going to a party super early just so you can put your fucking coat in a cloakroom. It almost feels like you're in primary school or something. It continues. Um, music. Um, Yana Maste, Kla and Freddie. Beautiful progression. Um, quality music too fast for my taste and feet so my stamina was suffered but no real objection and complaints here now open actually i'm curious to see because um freddie k is going to be playing in fold in july on the 20th i think and i'm going to be going there um i've not been the biggest fan of freddie k i've seen him a few times seen him play at fold seen him play on the same lineup with devious one and Rene y saw him play at fucking um what's it called e1 that fucking zionist venue and he wasn't that great either but everyone keeps saying he's the best dj in the world so i have to see him properly so he's playing here in london and fold i think on the 20th of july so that'll be a good time to see him and i actually plan to go there there's the first time ever i'll be doing a fold i'll be doing like an opening closing so i'll be there from the actual start because i actually want to see what i want and see what the whole vibe is like and see if he can kind of convince me or you know change my mind as they say because you know he wants to change my mind i'd assume because i'm so important it continues um <laughs> now open of open floor i knew it won't be panel um, garden second floor but jesus booty shaking breaky stuff i didn't expect i wasn't in the mood for it so i didn't even try to get into it but that was definitely an interesting choice i'd say i would prefer other music in that context selection now that was a borderline offensive i'm not too sure if it was just done to project that they also curate a crowd but given the results of it, it seems to be just for show several diehard bergen friends bergheim friends sorry with a ticket were rejected i also um barely got into it barely got in after a bullshit interrogation have you ever been here before who's playing today etc i love how people from Bergheim almost feel like they're like a special class of people that they should get into all clubs as if anybody gives a fuck like <laughs> i love it man like the <laughs> the fucking ego that people have just because they go places is absolutely insane it almost reminds me of like fashion people you know because they buy certain brands they feel like they're like you know it's like people that are into prada they almost feel like they're more intellectual or something it's like bro like Musha Prada doesn't know you. Raf Simmons doesn't know you. Nobody knows you. Like, just buy your thing and go home. Um, but I love this attitude. I love this. While Bergheim tries to curate a diverse set of guests, my feeling from yesterday was that the more heroin chic, techno hipster, the better. Um, there was less age diversity and solo queues were subject to extra scrutiny. What I love in Bergheim is that I can always observe other people like me inside solo, but popping up in different friend circles for a while. Didn't see much of that yesterday. Many clicky groups are stuck together and are all playing dress up. I don't have a problem with this. I know it's annoying, but I don't have a problem with this. It seems like they're actively not chasing, but they're actively catering to our audience. That's perfectly fine. I think you need to have that. There's not many... Because I don't think those these people will be happy to go to Watergate. Watergate is probably a little bit too commercial for them. Maybe Trezor is a bit too old. Maybe Bergheim is a little bit too snobby. So these people need places to go to. These kids who are on TikTok, who are like TikTok techno hipster fans, whatever they may be. I think it's perfectly fine to give them a space and you know rso seems to be the place to go um you know what to expect there you know how it's going to be it's probably going to be a bunch of people you know dressed up in like you know corny um harnesses that they bought from fucking amazon and shit and shitty pvc stuff you know what it's going to look like you just go there for the dj you go there for the rave and you kind of go home but being overly judgy about it is a bit lame and you know it is what it is um the vibe selection greatly direct sorry selection directly influence the vibe i will double down on my first impressions from yesterday and revise that 70 percent tiktok 30 percent Berghain now it just felt like a random techno party anywhere i would maybe compare it to the friday party at Berghain's via vibe adjacent but different again i don't think that's a bad thing i i purposely hate it that all clubs especially some of them in london try to put you know 
like copy the Bergheim thing like do your own thing you know what I mean like come at it from your own angle have a different selection policy have a different programming thing that you do so you have to give people a reason to go not just try and copy some things from another place it doesn't make any sense so the fact that they're trying to go for more for a TikTok generation crowd makes more sense and they're also younger maybe they have more disposable income maybe they're just more open to like partying more regularly they're going to stay more often they're, gonna, they're not going to fucking write essays on Reddit and shit that might be the reason why they do it Another one. People were young and ruthlessly stomping around the dance floor. I couldn't dance for 10 seconds without somebody crashing into me. Very egotistical crowd. Does your 10 people crew really need to walk all the way from the back to the DJ podium through the packed Freddy floor? To be fair, this happens a lot in Bergheim too. There's some fucking super aggy gay guys in there that roll through like they own the place, which they technically do because it's kind of their space. I get it. But there's some aggressive dick gay dudes in Bergheim too who that don't fuck around they don't play and you turn around you want to say something and you just see this fucking this 3d chest this 3d fucking you know guy that's built like a brick shit house you're like you know what i'm gonna let you just go through man <laughs> i'm good i'm gonna let you just go through <laughs> but you get a lot of guys crashing into you over there sometimes crashing into you because you know they want to stick their penis in you but sometimes crashing into you because they want to get to the dj with and you let them go through you let them go through. Despite that, I still don't see interesting chats with people. Many funny quips with the many Bergheim Sunday regulars roaming around. I guess it's something you only experience when you go to a place regularly. But on on God, like, I would never even... I'm so in my own zone. I would never, n number one, notice somebody, let alone notice somebody that goes to a particular club. That must be, you must be really going out a lot if you start to notice, oh, this is a Bergheim regular. This person's an RSO regular. That person goes to this. Like, what? Like... Well, anyway, overall sentiment. So I'll probably not choose an RSO weekend over, over a Bergheim one. For Oscar next month, I'll just go to see him and then go back to Bergheim. There's just something missing, the familiar coming home feeling. My guess is the mood ball for their positioning is we want to attract stereotypical younger, clicky fashion techno crowd and provide them with a space um, where they can go as a group. I think that makes sense to choose a slightly different angle. So I guess they, in conclusion, agreed with me that maybe them choosing to go for a younger crowd is a good thing. That younger crowd is also younger. You'd assume they're going to grow with RSO the same way I kind of grew with Berghain over the years and other people did also. And in general, it's going to be a good thing for the city because you're going to have a different place to go, a different type of vibe. If you're looking maybe for that type of sound, that type of, you know, stompy techno kind of vibe, you can know where to go. If you're looking for what you'd expect from a Bergheim place, you go so over there. Those options are good because we don't have them in London. We don't have those type of options. Everything, we, every place you go to is kind of the same and the only real standout place is Fold. And I feel like, in my personal opinion, you know, I don't like to go to the same place all the fucking time, no matter how good it is. So I would like more competition, but we don't have any. So the fact that these guys have two of these type of clubs that are open from like, you know, Saturday to Monday, the fact that they take them for granted is just, ugh, it's infuriating because we don't have, we don't even have one that's open from Saturday to Monday and they have two, maybe even more. Um, so yeah, so big up those guys, big up the person that added um, the review as well. Very, very, very good one here. A couple more points here, quick and I'll move on. It says, you summed up very well, RSO is not there just to be a real term to a competition. The crowd needs to grow up. The safety issues around the dance floor are borderline criminal. The area around the dark room stairs is a disaster. Another person says here, yeah, I think we need to stop comparing oranges and apples. I agree. Um, like not every club is trying to reproduce Bergheim or be a Bergheim alternative. Some focus on resident DJs, other promoters and parties, um, the different crowds. I don't think Grease Miller and RSO advertised themselves as a replacement. If anything, Grease Miller was a club you went to before graduated to Bergheim. These spaces are needed um i don't think i even went there before i just went there because an alternative i was pleasantly surprised by seeing a lot more top um half naked female bodies than i have done in a while happy to see women feel safer overall in the club again it's definitely something the scene has been lacking since covid also bergheim's overcrowded as devious one closing every weekend now yep yeah, so big up this person agree with a lot of points they made there and i can't wait to check out rso eventually when i do eventually go back which will probably be next month so i'm actually eager to check out for myself and see where i'm going and probably i'll do a little review myself of what i feel like when i actually go there i might do a little review myself when i actually go there you never fucking know you never fucking know and lastly on the club tip we have this really 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 cool post courtesy of fold um i haven't been folding a while i think maybe it might be a it might have been a year which is wild because i used to go every weekend when it first opened and i haven't been maybe in like a year i think it might be a year but um i'll be there soon 
And one update that I really like about them recently, and again, you know, for me, it's like a, I've kind of, I kind of got bored of going there because I went there so often. I wanted just a different option, but there's just no other option. They're the only people killing it. They're literally the best club in the UK, um, for better or worse. So you go there, you always, you're kind of guaranteed to have like a seven or an eight hour, 10 plus night. And this is another addition, which I feel like differentiates them and just gives them another level up. So this is courtesy of the Fold Instagram account. They have an app now where you can reserve a locker. I know this sounds minor to most people, but if you've ever been to Fold and you've ever tried to get a locker, you know how tedious and long the process is. You go in, you get searched, you go up the stairs, then you have to kind of, usually I think at one point they had the table at the front, then they put a table at the back. So you had to go through the entire fucking dance floor to get to the back, to then go do the whole thing where you sign your name on a sheet of paper and hand the person a deposit and get the, it's just a long and tedious process. But unfortunately if you didn't get there early enough because you only have a finite amount of lockers you might run out of them and they, you don't have any place to put your bag and fold is a great place but it's fucking hot and the air conditioning sucks so you're gonna be carrying your clumpy jacket all over the place and it's gonna be sweating you'll be annoying now they allow you to pre-reserve your fucking locker before you get there how sick is that all done via an app fucking cool so this is courtesy of their um, instagram account it says the following Hunting for the last um, available locker in the Unfold is now a thing of the past. Unfold is their parties to do on Sundays. Um, it says here, oh, 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 let's continue this. Hunting, hunting. With our brand new digital lockers, you can now reserve your locker in advance ahead of your event at Fold. Visit fold.elockers.shop and choose the event you'll be attending before selecting what size locker you would like, large or small. I think they said large is eight pound and the four and four pound is small. And these are pretty big lockers. They're like lockers you get in the gym, so you can probably stuff quite a lot of shit in there. Once you arrive at Fold, your reserved locker will be there waiting for you. No longer will you need to queue for a padlock or smuggle one in yourself, which I did plenty of times uh big up the guys who have the amount of times i've brought lockers in and tried to smuggle them in and got them fucking confiscated by the fucking bouncers is hilarious i probably wasted about 100 pound on like five pound lockers over the years absolutely stupid um but yeah you gotta do what you gotta do um as their locks are digitally locked and do not require any deposit which is cool too, by the way. So no padlocks anymore. You just have to remember your code. We have a double the numbers of, of these lockers um, that we have previously to ensure that you, to ensure all who want a locker will have one. Initially, just this weekend is available to reserve with the future events gradually coming available. For more information on how to reserve a locker, please visit the link below. What a cool system, isn't it? Again, it's a tiny thing. It's not that big of a deal, but considering fold is like an independent venue that only has been around for a few years and is relatively new and it hasn't got the resources or the monies that other clubs have the fact that they have this already and it's kind of done as a way to kind of you know make the clubbing experience for the customer a lot more pleasurable says a lot because even fabric even fucking fabric doesn't have this and fabric is you know uh, a legendary club in london got a lot of fucking history behind it and shit and even fabric doesn't have such an easy system for you to go in and reserve a locker and you know if you've been to again like i said fold is one of the best clubs in, in london or in the world or in the uk for the most part but it is extremely hot inside there so lockers are extremely important to maybe put some drinks in there to put your bag so you're not sweating the whole time and just in general just to kind of improve your fucking clubbing night it's just nice to have the locker there overall and the good thing as well if you go with friends i don't have any but if you have friends you could obviously you know just probably stick all your shit in one locker and just have it all reserved and all sorted out before ahead of time without having to get cash out and all that shit it's fucking fantastic so big up fold for this edition i think it's fucking cool um weirdly enough i bet you this minor thing or this no this consequential thing will probably improve the amount of people will probably increase the amount of people who want to go and club there because of how easy it is to use and shit and how better it's going to add to your fucking clubbing experience so i fucking love it i love it i absolutely love the addition of the digital lockers so big up them big up them so i want to move on to this quickly regarding jound jound have announced these really 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 cool buttery soft brown sambas and i think they look absolutely delightful and they happen to have the one and only the special one jose Mourinho, modeling for them 
absolutely fantastic. So this is courtesy of Jound. You know who Jound is. They do a bunch of collaborations with Adidas. They've done a recent one that came out that got a lot of controversy. Um, the Made in Germany, actually made in Vietnam, Adidas Sambas. I think I spoke about that on the previous pod. But they've now got another collaboration with Adidas under the with using the Sambas again, which I don't have a problem with, by the way. I think a lot of people are getting you know their knickers in a twist because it's another Samba, because it's a simple colorway. I personally love that Jound stick to what they do mostly monochromatic mostly very simple colorways but with the highest level quality of materials just to offer an alternative here. there's already loud many many loud um you know samba collaborations out there that you can get if you want to kind of express your personality through a pair of samba but if you just want a nice classic colorway especially an all brown sh- an all brown sneaker which you know is a classic with there's many all brown sneakers in the past i can think of like a curry dunk um, it's kind of you know a staple of in sneakers um you know you can always go with these type of ones especially when it's got this type of finish and suede on it as well because you're probably unlikely to get a level of samba like this um, done as a gr courtesy of ada so unfortunately only john can do it so i'm a big fan of these and as well so courtesy of the john website it says as follows ada's originals and john come together once more to unveil um, a new take on the other Samba shoe model, paying homage to the original Samba tobacco shoe model and accompanied by a capsule of apparel accessories, the collection is inspired by football heritage of court looks. This time, the classic hue and materials of a tobacco are applied on the iconic Samba silhouette, celebrating the year of the Samba in a blend of past and present added that this is a practice soccer ball complemented by a black nylon tracksuit tapped off with a versatile shoulder bag perfect for carrying essentials um the collection will be available from june 25th 12 p.m est on jam.com as well as the 27th on the confirmed adidas app and select stores so as you can see here you've got this buttery soft suede brown adidas samba essentially just two colors um i love the fact that i think i mentioned it previously before when it comes with shoes when they're like two i think i've said the perfect color combination is usually two to three colors but i love that when you have this sort of color you have this brown but you apply it in different materials you get different sort of finishes so on the stripes and on the heel tab you've almost got like a new buck finish but then on the main body you've got this hairy suede and then you've got this nice embossed gold foil jound logo on the side here so with this browns you get a different type of effect different finish of a brown because it's a new buck and you get different effect when it's in the hairy suede you get a different color when it's the laces the cotton ones and you get different when it's like the outwardly gum sole so i think that just makes it just look quite cool even if the hues are different even if the pantone color codes are a bit different i love that just changing the material can obviously change the final effect of the shoe itself and the color so that looks really really cool um as you can see here you've also got a nice jound hit on the inside of the insole which is really nice i love that they're flipped on either side so they're legible on either side that you're wearing them um the jet the samba tongue also isn't the super long one that flaps over like a soccer shoe it's a bit shorter um which i kind of prefer i'm not gonna lie and probably a little bit easier to wear but sometimes that flap can be a nice little detail um you got the heel tab that's completely plain i can feel like yep there's no um tray foil logo on the heel tab completely plain the only logos that you've got really showing is adidas are the stripes and you've got the jound embossing there so i think that's a nice touch as well because usually they have the adidas tray foil logo on the back of the heels but this is a nice little flip I'm not really too mad at that. Again, the buttery soft suede looks really fantastic. And then of course, as on the outsole, you've got this nice gum sole here, which, you know, is a classic when it comes to Samba. So I'm all well and good with that one. And then of course the box as well, classic blue Adidas box jound and the Adidas hit on the top. I think normal Adidas boxes have a bit of white in it, but they just went for the completely blue um, colorway, which I'm not too mad at. But the other thing that I really fucking love in this collection is some of the accessories. Um, the small capture collection you've got this really nice t-shirt um, I'm not really sure what the material is but it's almost like a soccer jersey done in a style of a t-shirt with Wrangland sleeves it's really fucking nice it's monochrome all white really fucking cool you've got two hits logos here you've got the what do you call it you've got the adidas logo on the crest here the trefoil on the chest and you've also got the the jam logo embroidered on the other side um what's the actual material here it says slim fit free stripe pattern self wrangling sleeve with free tone of stripes 
um, custom tonal embossed logo. I don't know what the material. Oh, it's hundred percent polyester. So it basically is a football jersey material, but it's kind of cut like a t-shirt. I love it. I love what it looks like. And obviously, you got the nice little hit there on the tag with a jound underneath the Adidas logo itself. And you've also got a really cool tracksuit, which is completely black. Um, Adidas tracksuit jacket, almost just like a coach jacket, a little bit. But it has got an elasticated waist here, if I'm not mistaken. Um, double sided zips, which I'm always a big fan of. Wrangler and sleeves, tonal. You can't really go wrong with that. And then you've got some track pants, which I would have preferred the track pants to be without the elasticated hems, personally. But considering these are Adidas track pants, you know, usually these sort of things, especially soccer ones, they kind of look good when they have the elasticated because you could usually just pull your socks over them and for a little bit of a styling hit. But I do prefer it without the elastic. But then the, the the biggest part as well is one of these bags. I think these are going to be very popular with a lot of people online. Um, the Jown shoulder bag. These are definitely prime for a festival. Stick a couple baggies of Ket in here and shit, you know. Uh, maybe a couple of edibles and a little zoot here when you're going to fucking best of all, wherever you're fucking going to. So these will be very popular, I think, especially with the embossed Jown logo, as you can see there. And a little Adidas tray foil logo there on the side. And then finally, you've got the ball and the most important thing. You've got the fucking campaign pictures featuring the special one and former Manchester United manager, Jose Mourinho, looking absolutely fantastic. He makes it look fucking great, by the way. He's got the Jown bag. He's got the jacket. He's, I think he's wearing also maybe a Jown Oxford shirt. That might be a collaboration with Brooks Brothers or something. But he makes the fucking thing look so fucking cool. Like, you cannot deny that he does make it look fucking amazing. Even the shoes. Look at how Jose, look at Jose Mourinho stunting. Look at him stunting in the shoes. Look how good they look on him. Fuck, bro. This is why I mean Jound is perfect because they do all this sort of stuff and it's really subtle, but most likely you won't be able to find a tr Adidas tracksuit in that particular style with that particular finish. Um, the added, you know, added Jound thing on the top maybe gives it a bit of an extra splice. So if you're in the know, you'll know Wild Guan, but if you like your loud collaborations, you might be a bit annoyed by it, but I fucking love it. Like, look how great that looks. If you saw some guy sitting in the cafe wearing this fucking outfit, you'd think they, they, they were swagged out. There's no way that you would not be impressed if you saw someone in a cafe just sitting down with these buttery, soft, brown Adidas Sambas, you know, on their phone and shit with this great fucking tracksuit. Like, what a great fucking lookbook and shoot. I fucking love it. What a great result. So big up, John. Big up, Justin Saunders. Always love their collaborations and what they do. And I think they knocked this one out of the park once again. Jose Mourinho modeling them. The only thing I'd say is a little faux negative. The lacing is fucked. I'm not a big fan of how everyone doesn't lace their shoes properly. I hate this type of lacing. Like, you got to relace this shit. This has to be over, not under, but whatever. But that's just nitpicking. But I don't like the fact that people just take shoes from the factory and just put them on models and don't actually relace them. But you can't be mad at this. Like, you know, he's at some quintessential, it looks like a Spanish cafe, um, maybe somewhere in Madrid sitting down having a coffee having a good time and yeah i fucking love it i 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 love it and i will be trying maybe very unsuccessfully to get a pair myself let's see how that pans out big up fucking jound big up blood clot jound we love to see it we absolutely love to see it cool um moving on from that one I also went to quickly mention Jack Moose. Jack Moose have a collaboration with Nike coming out very soon. Um, I actually don't mind them. I'm not going to lie. I don't mind the Nike collaboration that Jack Moose put together. They've got these Nike Air Max 186, which I guess is meant to be the big window, but it's not really a big window. And they actually look a lot better than their previous collaboration. They did these ACGs, but I'm still confused. I'm still confused as to who these are for, because I don't necessarily think the Jack Moose woman would wear these shoes. So I'm wondering, who are they designing these sneakers for? It's so confusing. So it's an Air Max one. You know what Air Max one looks like. It's mostly tonal. The upper's a bit different to what you're used to. It almost feels like they have removed all the paneling and you've got this perforated design and you've got this cutout swoosh logo that's very small. Um, you've got this nice suede mud guard that almost looks inside out design wise you've got this very square window for the airbag which is completely different to how an mx one is it's usually kind of rounded off so i'm not really too sure what that is all about but design wise just objectively they look really cool i also like like at the bottom of the sole 
you have the Jack Moose logo on one shoe and the Nike suits on the other one, which is pretty cool. Imagine walking in the snow and leaving foot imprints with your Jack Moose thing on there. And the front is completely different too. So normal Air Max ones, the mudguard wraps around. This particular mudguard is kind of split on both sides. Um, this silver colorway is actually really, really nice. It kind of reminds you of the Air Max 97. They've got a really nice quilted lining here um, and the seals here have been sealed with the silk as well. So you've got this really nice silk, almost satin lining on the inside. The tongue is also really cool. You have this logo, Nike logo in the satin on one side and you have this circular Jack Moose logo on the other side. The laces are a bit weird. These really fat, wide laces with these weird little Nike end bits, which are a bit too much for me personally. But maybe provide regular laces i think the laces probably kind of distract from what's going on there too many swooshes there's like one two three four like all over the place i think you need to relax with the swooshes but overall not too shabby and i think they come in like white silver and red um maybe the red color is probably the poorest looking wise oh look at this look at the insole so the instep that's interesting the instep of the air max 90 or the air max one on the instep there's a really small window but then on the outside, the window's really long and elongated and rectangular shape. That's pretty cool. I don't, I don't really mind that. You don't usually see that on the air bubble. And then on the inside, you've got the instep as well. You've got a little silver um, swoosh here, and it matches the eyelet detail here on the top. So not too bad. But again, I'm confused as to who these shoes are for because. You look at Jack Moose, you look at what they make. And when I think of Jack Moose, personally for me, I know now the brand has kind of fallen off. But when I think of Jack Moose, I think of like spring 2018, one of their best collections. I think this is the one they debuted that huge floppy hat that was like viral all over social media for a while. And everyone was, and, and there's loads of fake copies of it as well, right? This look here. So I think of this like quintessential Parisian you know, sunning in the Mediterranean woman, um, maybe a very affluent and shit, but the type of person that probably wears flats and, and that might wear like gladiator sandals, who might go to the beach barefooted and shit. But this type of girl or this type of lady, I would never think that they would want to wear a pair of Air Maxes. That's why I'm confused about their collaborations. Like who are they, who are their collaborations actually for? Because this this sim this jack moose girl the one that i've got on the screen right now from spring 2018 they would never be seen dead in the pair of air max ones and even more so their previous collaborations they did these atgs um a couple of years ago that i think were one of the worst collaborations ever they're so fucking shit and um, they did these particular nike humaras and again i don't i don't see the jack moose girlies as they say online that would be into these shoes unless you're just into the brand itself it doesn't really match up to what they do so i wonder if they're purposely trying to gain a new audience or trying to differentiate it maybe this is a you know maybe this is an inkling they want to create a diffusion line i don't really know what's going on but i'm confused as to why this particular lady would want to wear a pair of air max ones like what the fuck was she especially ones that like maybe the white ones you could see them wearing but just the shape of them the silhouette would not go with anything that you see Jack Moose putting down the runway. So I wonder what the collaborations are about. Maybe it's just opportunity. Thinking about it out loud. Maybe it's just an opportunity that he couldn't turn down. Um, Nike are offering you a chance to collaborate on a shoe. And you're a brand, up and coming brand. You probably can't say no. Maybe for the look. And the ability to create footwear. Which is really expensive and shit. I get it. But I'm just confused as to what the what the what the connection is between these Air Max 1s. And what Jack Moose does as a company anyway overall. I just can't picture anyone from their lookbooks or from their runway collections, you know, or from their campaigns wanting to wear a pair of Air Max Ones. It's just, you know, or even browsing Hypebeast for the, for, the, for, the, for the number one, seeing them fucking queue up at fucking sneakers and stuff or, you know, checking their sneakers app. I don't know, this, this lady is probably out shopping somewhere in fucking Monaco. I wouldn't expect them to be trundling around in Air Max Ones with me and my friends, but... I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Who bloody knows? So, according to Hypebeast, is there a date on the release yet? No date when they're going to release. However, they're saying summertime in the summer. There's a better picture of them. Um, some free. The silvers are really nice, though. And I like how they changed the tip of them. So, they are quite cool. And because they're a limited edition shoe, they're probably going to do numbers anyway. I'm probably speaking out of turn and nobody was going to agree with me. They're going to sell out anyway. Now, there's a massive Jack Moose. I don't know what this hang tag is all about, by the way. 
that's just unnecessary waste of material i don't know what this is for maybe you're gonna put this on your bag but this huge jack moose hand tag and looks like the words are kind of skewed as well they're not really straight that also isn't weird and is the midsole navy it's not even black in it that's a bit weird isn't it silver and navy i'm not too sure if i'm too fond of that one but overall nice shoe um, I'm sure it's going to do numbers. It's going to probably sell out and go for crazy amounts of money on StockX, and I'll be looking like an idiot because I don't really like them too much. But yeah, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. I just don't, don't get it. But who, who knows? Maybe I'm the one that's in the wrong. Maybe I'm the one that's in the wrong. Who bloody knows? So. That has been the Agassino Zinger Show episode number 790, my friends. Thank you for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. Always a pleasure to have your company. Thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you for being a great audience. Make sure if you listen to the audio side of the pod, if you can, leave man a five-star review on all of the popular podcast streaming platforms such as Apple, Spotify, all that malarkey. Let people know that you've mess with a real you know let them know let them know um links to my show tools links to the stories will be in the description as per usual for those of you watching on the old youtube thank you for tuning in appreciate all of you as per usual um and yeah man thank you for hanging out with the boy thank you for hanging out with the boy for my tune today of course i'm going to play something from d one and only Don Tolliver album. I have to play Inside. That's one of my favorite songs right now. Curtis of Don Tolliver and Travis Scott. So that will be my tune today to close out for those of you who are watching via the YouTube. And those of you who are tuning in via the audio side of the pod, you will hear that song playing underneath my voice as I'm exiting this lovely, lovely stream. So thank you for tuning in. It's always a pleasure. Never, ever, 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 ever a chore. Thank you for tuning into the Agostino Zynga Show. And this is going to be Dom Tolliver inside. Don Tolliver inside. I'm going to be playing for you right now. <laughs>